My guest today is Peter Ritchie. Peter, how are you? I'm very good, thanks. How about you, David? I uh, couldn't be better. Uh, it's, <laughs> the sun is shining here in sunny Chicago. I made that up. It's actually foggy and cold, but I still, <laughs> the first part's true. I feel great. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do, Peter? Uh, I guess my title you could consider called being called uh, South Architect. So I work generally work with teams, uh, trying to get them to uh, write better software, construct better software, architect better software, all types of things like that, as well as helping them write software as well. Uh, and you gave a talk on how to write better software, uh, a really small slice, I think, uh, a small but important slice of, of writing quality software. You gave a talk on naming things in your software yeah. project. Uh, let, let's talk about that today. What's, uh, sure. Why is naming things important? Uh, it's a form of communication. So uh, as humans, I think we, we take for granted our ability to communicate. Sometimes we don't communicate as well as we can. And I think naming things in software is one of those areas that we can improve in, upon. Uh, and there's various techniques. I think one of the biggest things, I think, in any sort of communication, not just naming things, is being consistent in, in how we communicate the words we use and those types of things, otherwise known as naming things. <laughs> right. So if you and I are talking and we can agree that this is a glass, then we can talk mm -hmm. to each other. We both have an exactly. understanding. Exactly. Yeah. We all have the same terms, and uh, okay. we understand each other better. Let's apply that to software development. Give me some examples of bad versus good naming conventions. Uh, I, I think in terms of uh, naming things, oftentimes we, we tend to use abstract words, which can be can be multiple things. Um, like one of the things I go into in my talk is, is sort of talking about the existing. Uh, standards or guidance around naming things and, you know a lot of times that's you know use nouns for classes and verbs for methods and uh, sometimes you get into things like use adjectives for uh, namespaces and the current not namespaces but interfaces and things like that but you know if you get into those things and you know uh, i don't expect everybody to be a, an english nerd or a language nerd some of those things like a noun it can be very abstract like green for example is a, an example of a noun i give in my talk it's like well yeah, that's a noun on its own, but that's probably not a very good name for a class. And those types of things. So getting into it's, it's also an know, adjective, I think. When used with something else, like a, a green lemon, for example, that would be an adjective on its own. It's a noun, but it, you know, it, within a phrase, it becomes an adjective. And that's you know sort of the complexities of, of English and most other languages is you know everything's contextual. So if you use it in the wrong context, it's not going to have much meaning at all. Oh, okay. All right. So, so you're you're in favor of things like nouns for classes and verbs for methods, uh, but but think about you know is this a noun yeah. in every context? That's that's the idea here. Yeah, right. and then getting into some things like you know homonyms and homographs when you've got a word that's spelled. Oh, the same, those are good words. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, you were just about words to that define them. Yeah, words that are spelled the same but have different pronunciations or uh, have the same pronunciation but different spellings, those types of things. Those are homonyms and homographs. Okay. And those are areas which uh, I recommend people avoid when they can, like wound and wound. I mean, those are two different words, but they, they're spelled the same. Not that All you'd right. want to use those in any, any of your classes or methods or anything like that, but uh, sort of an idea of, of, of areas we can avoid that help us be a little bit more consistent and clear in our, in our communication of naming things. Got it. So removing ambiguity seems to be a big theme of everything mm -hmm. we've talked about so far. Uh, what are some, some things that we should strive to do? Those are things we should not do. What about things that we should strive to do? Uh, typically, I like to get teams to kind of agree on a set of terminology. Um, oftentimes, you know, that's, that kind of gets into domain terminology, but we can also focus on certain things like actions uh, and outcomes. For example, you know, you get into context like update or uh, change modify, those types of words, um, those can all mean the same things, but if they do mean the th same thing, then you use three different words and you've, you've introduced uh, an area that can be a, a, can introduce ambiguity. So I recommend, you know, everybody kind of get together as a team and decide what words they want to use for those, those particular things. For example, you might use the word change to mean I want to completely replace an entity or an object that you're working with, and modify will be modifying the attributes of that of a particular entity, those types of things. And if everybody kind of agrees to that and everybody uses that consistently, that means it's, the code is much easier to read, modify, 
and understand. Yeah, I was actually uh, had a um, I was working with a blog engine that I use for my for my blog, and the engine has a button on the post that says edit, mm-hmm. or also another button that says create new post, and at the bottom of that there's a button that will commit those changes to the the database, and the na- label on that button is also edit. Mm-hmm. Whereas I, I think save would be much more intuitive. It confused me the first time I saw it. I'm, I'm already editing. Yeah, um, exactly. Um, what, what do you think about um, uh, names that are really long, like method names or, or class names, that uh, if you want to describe something, you use an mm-hmm. almost an entire sentence to do so? Is that? Yeah. What's your opinion on that? Um, varied, really. I mean, I, in my talk, I kind of talk about things like that, and it, I think it's important to understand to use the, the appropriate terms for things. But, you know, for example, a supercalifragilistic exialidocious is what you need to call something, then you call it that. Mm-hmm. But if you get into situations where you've got a method name with words like and in it, then you've probably got something that's doing too many things, and you probably want to focus the methods on particular things, and then you can get more concise naming with that. Uh, but if it's a long name and it you know, doesn't use the word and in the name of a method, for example, then it, it yeah. might be the right name. It just In the context, it has to be correct, basically, is what I get down to. Yeah, I was thinking of something like save customer invoice to Cosmos database. You know, a very specific yeah. name, but it but it might uh, might scroll off the page when or off the screen when you're reading it. Uh, yeah. A good good uh, Mary Poppins reference there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, and I, I like the idea. So just and this is sort of an example. As I name something and I think about it, it may it, it may reveal something about the class. Exactly. For example, yeah. if the word and is in there then maybe my class is violating the single responsibility principle. Yeah, that, definitely those types of things. I don't, I, I've given talks on solid before, so I don't get into too many details of sort of the solid principles. But I do talk about, you know, kind of understanding that nothing's going to be perfect. Don't, you know, get into analysis paralysis, trying to write all the perfect names. Just start writing things. And I talk about things like, you know, you start with unit test one and test method one, those types of things. That's fine. As long as you understand that things are going to evolve over time, your understanding is going to evolve over time and improve over time, and work that into the naming of things. And sometimes you need to refactor and change the name of things, or you know, refactor things into multiple things, and then you obviously you need multiple names, and then that's how you understand things better and come up with better naming. Uh, so you're saying it's okay to have bad names originally, as long as you recognize exactly, yeah. that, uh, that as you refactor. That's, that's one of the things you want to look at. Uh, what, what's the best way, if you're on a team, you talked about consistency of naming conventions on a team, what's, what's the best way to communicate with each other and, and uh, establish those conventions? Um, in terms of a team, it's usually, you know, very informal. We talk to each other you know, over chat or something like that. Eventually, I, I like to have things in sort of documented somewhere, where, wherever that might be, SharePoint or Git, GitHub, those types of things. Um, I'm a, a fan of doing things like our actual decision records. And not necessarily kind of with, you know, that level of detail, but something like that in terms of decisions that are, have been made. Uh, when I get into larger teams, when I'm talking about multiple teams and, you know, uh, teams of teams, those types of things, I like to have weekly or bi-weekly meetings to talk about those things. Bring them up as a topic. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, this is, a, this is what happened. This is the decisions that were made. People can d- discuss it if they want. Otherwise, people understand that those things have happened and they, they can research them on their own, in their own time. Uh, and if somebody's passionate about it, they can talk about it. Sometimes it happens and, you know, people chat about it a lot or sometimes they don't and everybody just sort of, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's, let's use edit instead of edit, modify, change, and whatever other synonyms we can come up with for that particular word. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been on teams, uh, uh, particularly larger teams that have a, um, what's it, a, a, Design document or not a, not a standards document, right? And uh, it's a living document, but it's someplace we can go. If there's ever any question about, if there's ever any argument between you and I, and we have a between you and me about what the proper name of this thing is, we can always refer back to that. And hopefully, it's been there. And if it's yeah. not, then let's make a decision and update that document. That's exactly that's the way my teams typically work. Yeah, and one thing I like to have in that is, is a vocabulary, is understand what the what terms apply to the particular domain we're working with, uh, making sure that's all in one place, you know, yeah. not just a, a set of words, but also kind of, you know, description of each or definition maybe of each one, so everybody understands where they can go to to find all the terms that might apply to what we're working with. No, great point. If you're writing an application about, uh, I don't know, the medical industry, they may have words mm-hmm. that 
have the same thing in the construction industry, but they mean very different things. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> what else? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, getting into some of the details of things like adjectives is probably important. Um, sometimes we can kind of talk about adjectives in a way that, you know, I mean, as I said, I don't expect everybody to be an English nerd or a language nerd, so saying the word adjective to somebody might not necessarily land with them very well. It's kind of a, you know, consequence of naming things sometimes. Mm -hmm. But we can build on adjectives when we talk about things like interfaces, where an interface is a description of something that has a behavior. So when we talk about things like adjectives, what we really want to get out of that is an adjective that is a description of a behavior. Uh, for example, transmissive. Uh, the, the verb transmit, we can translate that into a, an adjective by adding a suffix to it, if, uh, and then we've got something called transmissive, and now we've got an adjective we can use for an interface that describes something that will transmit something. Mm. So building on, you know, those English words, you know, action words or verbs and things, and building those out into nouns or adjectives, and working those into the way we, we name things is often very useful. So sometimes, you know, when people, you know, decide they wanted to define an interface, they simply just add an I to the, the name of the class and call that yeah. the interface. And maybe that's not the best thing. Sometimes maybe it is, but in most of my circumstances I run into, that's not necessarily the best thing. And what we really want to get out of that is, is a description of behavior, not just an interface that we can use to inject it into something else. Yeah. By the way, I just recently learned that, that adding an I at the beginning, that's a .NET thing. In the Java world, they actually have a different naming convention. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it confused the heck out of Or actually confused the heck out of my teammates <laughs> when I started adding yeah. this I. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Those idioms that kind of get people confused a lot, which, you know, gets down to naming things. If we had a consistent naming thing across all languages, that would be better. But that, I think that's a struggle for another time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, agreed. Uh Anything else that, uh, what pearls of wisdom you can add? Uh, I think the biggest thing, well, actually getting into some of the things, uh, kind of, you know, English is obviously one of the harder parts of naming things, but I think the domain we're working in and the business related around it is, is often the hardest thing. Uh, I don't know, don't know about you, but oftentimes when I get, you know, communicating with clients and customers, uh, asking them what they want is sometimes, you know, tricky. You don't necessarily get the answer you want. Oftentimes, you know, we do things like Agile to get things out there so they can give us feedback on, on the product we're trying to generate for them. And we do that because they, they can't communicate always right. about what they need or what they want out of things. So uh, kind of understanding that, that you know, quagmire of, of, of getting those types of requirements out of our customers is, is important. Uh, and I get into things like understanding kind of the vision behind what we're working on, not necessarily the business vision, but possibly the technical vision. Understanding those things to allow us to guide us towards some of the aspects of what we're working on, mm -hmm. focus on, you know, different aspects of the business instead of the entire business and allow us to kind of limit the number of words that we might have in our vocabulary that we might need to choose from, for example, is, is often useful to try to understand better what we're trying to build for the customer, that, that way we can understand better how to name these things. Uh, and a lot of it kind of falls back onto, you know, we're not going to be able to come up with something perfect. It needs to change. We need to give, give them something that they can work with to give us that feedback so we can make it better. And then when we make it better, obviously the naming might need to change along with it. So That's interesting. It, so the, I, I think of, when we think of uh, naming things in code, I think of doing that for the benefit of other developers. And mm -hmm. you're saying that there's actually an interaction with uh, with the customer, the people that we're actually building the software for, who may never even see the code. Exactly. And in my talk, I often get into things like domain-driven design, which really tries to focus on the business language of what we're dealing with. And they have a concept called ubiquitous language that basically tells developers that they should be using the language of the business in everything they do, not just in communicating with the business, but writing the software. Uh, and what that allows us to do is not only kind of have a focused vocabulary instead of possibly two vocabularies, one that's technical, one that's business related, and mapping between the two, uh, which often in, in introduces ambiguity and, you know, differences that can often make it difficult to communicate those types of things, but also let you focus on a single vocabulary uh, and it make it a lot more clear in what we do, not only just in our communication with the business, but also uh, our communication with each other in terms of the code. Peter, I think a lot of people have, uh, they're kind of aware of, of 
naming conventions and mm-hmm. uh, obviously the, the software developers actually are naming things, but they haven't really thought about it like you have. What what advice would you give folks to get started? That really this is the first time that they've thought that this is an important area. Uh, well, I, ca- I kind of got into it based on you know a Phil Carlton uh, comment. I don't know if it's a comment or axiom or whatever it might be, um, but he basically said there's two two hard things in software engineering. Cash and validation and naming things. That kind of got me into, okay, well, why is it hard? Why is naming hard? So I kind of get into it in that aspect. So, I mean, finding an interest in something for me is often the best way to, to kind of dig into something. So um, find something about naming things that's interesting. Maybe it's part of the English language. Maybe it's a, a silly quote from Phil Carlton or something like that. But uh, that has helped me dig into it a lot more. And once I got into it, I, I realized there's uh, all sorts of different facets of what we what we need to use in terms of naming, not just English, but understanding the business, vision, motivation of the business, those types of things. And there's a lot to dig into there. So that's, that's you know, if, if you're interested in it all there's, all, there's all sorts of things to get into that make it a little bit more interesting once you get there. Any resources you could recommend to learn more about this? Um, I've got a GitHub repo where I kind of collect a lot of things. Um, in my talk, I, I kind of limit things to about an hour, but you know the content of what's on my GitHub repo, uh, which is you know GitHub.com slash Peter A. Ritchie slash naming things, no spaces at all. Um, and there's a lot more information there. If I, it, I suppose if I took all the information I have there and created a talk out of it, it would probably be more like a workshop, at least 48 hours. Um, so there's lots of stuff there. I'm, I'm constantly trying to add to it and those types of things. So but that's probably a good resource. Uh, there's also some links on there that go into some kind of naming standards that I've found over the years. When, once I started looking into this, I found a little bit more information on some other people's naming standards, which get more into naming than, you know, case standards, those types of things. I don't really get into case standards too much. Uh, I'm just focused on the naming. If you want to use, you know, underscores in your names and those types of things, that's completely up to you. It's more of a style, in my, yeah. my opinion. So I kind of focus yeah. on the names. Consistency is more important, I think, than exactly. Yeah. I'm looking. I'm looking yeah. at a repo right now. This is really good. There's a lot of information, not only directly in here, but also links to other resources. So this is a great starting point here on your yeah. repository. I'll put a link in the show notes to that. Yeah, and I get into some of the details about English in there that you. you uh, for me, when I get into it, I needed to refresh in English because you know an adjective and a you know noun and a noun phrase and an adjective phrase, those types of things. Yeah kind of just went over my head when I started looking at it, so I had to refresh my, my mind on that. It's been a, at least a couple of years since my last year's it, course. Imagine <laughs> if you didn't grow up speaking English like we did. Yeah, yeah, it'd be even harder, harder, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and English is kind of funny. It's not, I mean, other languages are kind of the same, but with English it's basically you just keep saying something long enough it becomes, you know, part <laughs> of the right. English language. Which means like, there's literally, a lot of exceptions. Yeah, like, like literally, literally, for don't, example, don't, literally don't, means don't. figuratively now. Because we you know, people used it so often as, as uh, the word figure that it became my head literally the same thing, exploded so. when I heard that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah, English is hard. So that that's one of the big things. So it's a bit unfortunate that that became a yeah. de facto standard for computer programming. But yeah. uh, but it's lucky for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one less thing to learn. For sure. Uh, Peter, thank you so much. This is really interesting. It's a th- topic that I've uh, I haven't really thought that much about. So I learned a lot. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I've been very fortunate that technology has allowed me to make a lot of wonderful friends.